Welcome to the Dealer Playbook Podcast. My name is Michael Cirillo, and each week I sit down with the brightest minds in marketing, sales, and leadership to help you level up your career in automotive. Thank you so much for spending your time here with me today. Now let's open up the playbook. Here we go. Hey, welcome back to the Dealer Playbook Podcast. So glad you're joining me today. I am joined by my friend Bill Playford, a partner over at Dealer Knows Consulting, and we are talking about how to disrupt the automotive industry. Stay tuned for all the power bombs and nuggets in this episode. Here we go. Sure thing, Mr. President, right away. All right, so I'm sitting down now with first-time guest of the Dealer Playbook podcast, Mr. Bill Playford. Yes, Jen Dunstan, he is a real person. (laughs) He is the partner at Dealer Knows Consulting, involved in a lot of really, really cool stuff. Man, thanks so much for joining me on the Dealer Playbook. Thanks for having me. So, you you know, I... Obviously, I'm kind of one of those silent followers of yours where, you know, I see you, you, the articles you post and uh, I read them and they're engaging and they're they're very thought provoking. Something that always uh, stands out to me about the information you put out is is just kind of the level, the, the kind of deep thought that goes into it first off. But you get a real sense of here's a guy who wants to promote positive change in the car business. Uh, You know, maybe call it a a revolution of sorts. Get people thinking bigger. Get people thinking about things that matter. You know, there's this quote, and I can't remember who who said it, but uh, I'll find it. We'll link to it in the show notes. Uh, when, When you can no longer do what you've always done, you can only do what matters most. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of the thought that comes to my mind as I consume the information you put out there. You're a disruptor. And that's kind of what we want to talk about today. In your opinion, Bill, why does this industry need some disruption? And where where should we be moving? Like, what's the direction we should be moving in? Well, that's like the $64,000 question is where should we be going? Um, you know, our customers tell us where should we be going, but uh, let, let's let's talk about the first part. Uh, I've been involved in the car industry for since I've been 18 years old, actually building parts at a factory. So I've, I've kind of ran the gamut in terms of things that I've done in the auto business. But, you know, one thing that, that it's been going on since I've been involved uh, in the retail side of things is that the same things just happen over and over again. You know, I mean, I started selling cars, you know, selling cars as much as you can do over the Internet back in the early 2000s for a little rural dealership in Michigan. We didn't have all these special tools. We didn't have uh, Y Combinator backed entrepreneurs and those types of things. Right. We just did it. Yeah. And, um, and to a large degree, things haven't changed in that, you know, 15 years or so since we've been doing these types of things. Um, we sort of set the expectation that things are going to be different for the consumer. Um, and largely they get presented the exact same options as they would have in the 90s, let's say. Mm-hmm. But even in terms of what we do to ourselves, we, we we think about these changes. We talk about these things we want to do. We get pumped up at these conferences. We get pumped to watch a Gary Vee video. And they're forced into the same box that we, we've, you know, we've come to know and trust and, and sort of love. You know, it's sort of, what is it, Stockholm Syndrome or whatever. Yeah, people yeah. Have. They're afraid to, to kind of get out of that. And uh, I just feel like that in order for us to change and to move forward and to be really more congruent with, with how the market's changing and how consumer behavior is changing, like we have to disrupt this business in some way, shape or form. It's almost like, um, you know, the, the, the what am I thinking of the five uh, sequences of market sophistication or marketplace sophistication mm-hmm. where, you know, if if we go back to the Henry Ford days and we look at how the Model T was sold, I mean, Look, the guy had, you know, for all intents and purposes, in contrast to today, I would I would submit that things were a little bit easier because he had to be like, it's a car. And people were like, holy crap, I want a car. 
the the problem is the market has become so much more sophisticated. We can't get away with promoting a message of it's a car or it replaces five horses or, you know, those sorts of things. Cause people are like, yeah, but you know, there's so many other things that I care about. Um, Mm -hmm. and so, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but I almost feel like we are still in the kind of mindset of the Henry Ford days and how we work with clients and customers, but the customers are sitting here and to reference what you said earlier, they want so much more and they're kind of the ones that dictate you know, that change is necessary or whatnot. So, I mean, what do we do? What, what should we be focusing on to promote this change? Well, I mean, there's a, a lot of, I mean, we, we got a finite period of time here. <laughs> we could talk yeah. about this for a few days, but sure. I, I think in terms of just uh, being just aware of the marketplace to your point, I mean, you make a good point. I mean, when Henry Ford was making the Model T, any color you want, as long as it's black, black. Right. You know, the alternatives were a lot of times bespoke, you know, kind of coach built vehicles um, was a different market. And even when a lot of our our mentors in the car business came up, I mean, you had Ford, you had GM, you had AMC, you had Chrysler. And, you know, Honda was something that you laughed at, you know, and Toyota wasn't you know even on the radar screen. I mean, and all these things have changed. And now, you know, you have Kias that are rear wheel drive and 360 some horsepower. If you saw the news in the Detroit Auto Show, yep. I get there tomorrow. It's like my Christmas. <laughs> um, but I mean, things have changed so much and it's harder for consumers to make a decision. Uh, not to mention they have so much information, uh, so much more information than they had even five years ago. And I don't think it's it's a matter of having different ways to submit leads online or being able to do things from, from that type of standpoint. It's a matter of like, how do we talk this person as a real person? Not like a mass produced Model T person, but maybe back to that coach built bespoke vehicle type person. Like what are they trying to accomplish? Mm-hmm. You know, what are they actually going to use in this vehicle for? How long, you know, how long they plan to keep it? You know, those types of questions where we just can't jam that into a traditional road to the sale. Do you think, I, I mean, what, What's the hesitation? Why, why aren't we, I I mean, I I don't want to generalize or overgeneralize. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are some progressive dealers that uh, are thinking outside the box or they're at least Mm -hmm. really getting there and they're starting to ramp up, but to large scale, I mean, it's not really happening. What do you think the hesitancy is to interact with or embrace the customer's journey to, to what you just talked about? Well, I think if like my last blog post, for instance, I kind of went off on a bit of a of a tirade there, and you know, it's like a thousand word <laughs> diatribe. I'll freely admit it, but uh, it, at any rate, um, it's a situation where we can't measure our success, and a lot of times we fall back on those kind of heuristics or your rules of thumb about how what makes us successful. We're a thirty car month person. We're, you know, we set you know fifty appointments a day. I mean, whatever those metrics are, um, those are sort of measurements of success, but are those really measuring success or not, or just making us feel better about what we do? And I think there needs to be better tools out there, different technologies, and and by no means am I going to be the expert on this or know all the answers to this. These sure. are things that I'm just I'm committed to exploring and, and will be until I get those answers. But you know, there needs to be a movement to better understand those interactions and better understand what customers we're dealing with and their needs, uh, being able to isolate those t- customers and being able to reach those customers customers in a way that they want to be, um, you know, they want to be handled or want to be interacted with instead of just carpet bombing Model Ts on everybody. Yeah. Well, it's very, um, I feel like it's very in the moment, for example, and I'll, I'll give a personal example. You know, I mean, obviously as a marketing agency, um, a lot of, I guess, in the moment success is found in the, the uh, performance indicator of are our clients happy and are they sticking with us? You know, and then all of a sudden somebody who you thought was happy, a client that you thought was happy decides to cancel. Right. Whether it's the shiny object syndrome or, you know, there's a new craze or whatever it is, for whatever reason, they decide to uh, cancel and, and move on. And and we sit here as a team sometimes and we go, oh man, that really kind of sucks. We are failing, you know, and sound the, you know, sound the alarms, DEFCON 5, let's release the, you know, the jazz, what's going on with you? And then we yeah. come to a realization where we're like, but wait a second, we really, 
focus deeply on customer interaction, building relationships of trust, you know, um, um, showing love, thank you economy, whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then all of a sudden you see many of these clients start to return back to you after they've experienced what else is out there. And then you go, Mm -hmm. Oh wait, actually we are, you, you know, we are doing okay. But I feel like a lot of people are getting stuck in that moment and I'm guilty of Uh it where it's like, Oh man, they left. We're not successful. We're failing. We're this, we're that. Mm -hmm. Um, do you find like that's, that's part of this where we're so caught in the moment of these KPIs that they dictate to us more than they probably should? Well, I think they do. I think in a lot of situations, especially when you're adapting a new process, uh, maybe you're ad- adopting a new process, a better way to put it. Yeah. Um, you know, you're testing on a new website, you're testing a new, you know, SEO, you're testing an agency, you're testing on a new campaign. Sure. Whatever the case may be, um, you know, you hear all the great things. It's the shiny object syndrome, as you just said there. And that's, hey, I'm not getting these results. Yeah. And a lot of it is that, okay, now let's go back to where our comfort zone is. And, um, you know, trust me, I'll, you know, I don't like to point fingers or besmirch anybody's name, but there's a lot of companies out there yeah. that present they present the best case scenario. Sure. And we've we've all seen it, and that's the best case scenario. Yeah. And um, you know, and because we're not effective at measuring ourselves, we can't really compare it. You know, our our KPIs don't line up. You know, or we don't have enough KPIs to really know if we're performing well or not, or or to give it a chance. And so. Um, you know, to your point, some people might just run away and keep going from agency to agency or for, you know, to, we see it all the time, like CRM to CRM to CRM. Sure. Yeah. And, uh, it's some, sometimes it's not that their fault. It's not the agency's fault. It's not the CRM's fault. Sure. It's that you're not properly measuring your success. It's a human thing. I mean, I feel like, you know, I just had a conversation with a, a colleague of mine who was like, man, I just, I don't. I, I feel like I'm just running in circles and I, and I just said, well, hold on a second. What are you trying to achieve? Like, where are you trying to end up? What's your objective? Mm-hmm. And he had no clue. And I'm like, well, that's why you're running in circles. Yeah. And do you think that plays into this? I mean, just the, you know, forget the vendors and the, you know, this clash of dealer versus vendor and all these sorts of things. Yeah. I mean, that's an evidence in my opinion of, you just haven't figured out as an individual what you want. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's time you can figure it out. But is that what you're seeing? Is that kind of what, what you're getting at? Like, hey, figure out what you want first, and then that's going to dictate the path you take to get there. Yeah, to a degree. But it's also understanding the best that you can be and just accepting mm-hmm. that. You know, I while I appreciate the positivity movement, you called me a positive person. I appreciate that. But I mean, like, just because I want to beat LeBron James in a slam dunk competition doesn't mean that I'll ever be able to do that. I just won't. Like I accept that limitation. Yeah. I will never be an Olympic sprinter. You know, I will never be able to sure. swing the swim the English Channel. Um, and I'm, but I'm okay with that because yeah. I, I want to be the best person I can be. I want to have the best clients I can have, based on that formula of whatever they are. And I think part of the issue is let's take the vendors out, let's take that out of the equation, but let's talk about just how we compare ourselves at an OEM level. You know, we see a lot of times where we get dealers that are just happen to be in the same geographical zone mm-hmm. as like the big city dealership that's got infinite inventory and every permutation of car on the lot. Right. It's not a fair comparison. It's just, it's not, you know, and that dealership's like, why I suck? I'm in my 20 group. <laughs> it's another thing. I'm in my 20 group and I'm just doing terrible. And this guy is getting four thousand dollars of the growth on it gross on everything and why can't i do that well it's like that that's his market yeah you know if he's the only honda dealership in a three-hour radius like he can probably ask what he wants to ask for the cars he's gonna get it oh yeah my service area has a population of four hundred thousand people and, mm-hmm. and yeah we do that all the time right we're comparing to somebody else's you know we we, we are comparing ourselves to our perception of what their success mm-hmm. is and then we fully forget about all of the factors that would contribute to that that are just kind of baked in like the size of their market uh where they're located it's like we you know a san luis obispo dealership will not sell as many cars as a downtown la dealership or something like that yeah i mean well and that's you know we're talking about entrepreneurship before we 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 went on the call here but i mean it's one of those things where um, you're comparing things that happen in Silicon Valley versus what happens in Topeka, Kansas or something like that. Like <laughs> the guys in Topeka could have a fantastic idea and they could be cash flow positive and they can have all these things, but they don't have that, that cool sexiness of the Silicon Valley. 
yeah. and the investors will flock to the the guys in the valley you know and it's it's it, you can't measure yourself against that like you have to figure out you know based on the the hand you're dealt how you're going to make the best out of it yeah and like I said, it's not, I don't think it's a defeatist attitude. I don't think it's it's being pessimistic. It's just a matter of like, we need to measure ourselves against the best that we can be. Well, it's we can like, move, you know, we can move to the valley, or we can move yeah. to LA. You know, yeah. we could do it there, or we yeah. could take take a hundred percent market share where we're at. Yeah. It, well, it's it, it and it, it's like, uh, you know, I don't I don't take it as a defeatist attitude. I take it as quite optimistic because you're still placing control in yourself and, and rather than, fo- you know, I, I had this conversation with my seven year old the other day, we're sitting there and, you know, in our household, we, we, we really strive for a culture of gratitude, you know, choose happy, those sorts of things. Mm-hmm. And he was sitting with me and he says, you know, dad, I, uh, I just wish I got this one toy for Christmas. And I was like, that's a pretty cool toy, huh? He's like, yeah. And I said, but what about the other toys? Like, did you get any other toys you loved for Christmas? He's like, oh yeah, I love this one and this one. And then <laughs> it was a shift, right? He, and, and kind of where I'm going with this is instead of us always focusing on that one thing we don't have mm-hmm. and probably haven't even internalized enough to know if we need it or not, we, yeah. we lose sight of all of that. The, the things that we already have. One of those things in this context being the control to do or try something. Yeah. You know, and it's, it's a, just a matter of, I just had this conversation with, uh, I was training uh, some BDC agents this morning and we we're on our weekly call. And, and I said, like, they like, well, we deleted our, our spreadsheet from last month of our, our metrics. I'm like, well, why'd you do that? Like, well, we couldn't get the formulas to line up. I'm like, that's an easy fix. But I'm like, the reason why that's important is because right now you're complaining how bad things are in January and you're comparing yourself against last month, which is historically one of the best months of the year. Last two weeks are are crazy. Everybody's busy. Everybody's killing it. And then you go to no incentives. You know, it all starts over again. And, And this is one of the few businesses really where that happens in the car business. It makes it unique in that respect. I mean, I don't think that, you know, Google has, you know dramatically lower revenue from December to January. I could be wrong. I don't work there, but I'm just going to go on a limb. You sure. know what I mean? Yeah. You know, most businesses use quarterly metrics, you know, dealerships use monthly metrics Yeah. and it's just hard for people to grasp. Whereas if they could look back to January of last year and go, Hey, wait, we're ahead of the game. You know, we had, you know, 69 out, uh, now and we only had 53 out last year. Like we're doing great. Yeah. Year over year we're, we're improving. It, it, Exactly. And see how that changes to where it's like we suck because we're we're measuring ourselves against something that's not realistic. So that, December that, is only comparable to December, basically. It's a big. Yeah. I mean, you bring up a big flaw. What a why do dealers track only 30 days at a time or a month at a time? Is that a is that an OEM thing that we've adopted? It's it's an OEM thing. I mean, it's that's the only reasonable answer because the incentives change. Sometimes they change two, three times a, a month, but I mean, it's the scramble. I mean, you hear it on the agency side. Oh, it's end of the month. Don't call me. We're busy. We're you know all hands at neck right now. Yeah. And you know, last two weeks of the month are typically far busier than the first two weeks of the month. That doesn't matter if it's up in you know British Columbia or if it's sure. in Indiana. Yeah. You know, I mean, these things happen, and so they they sort of follow this this cycle. But like I said, relative to other businesses, it's sort of unnatural because you're only looking at 28 days, 32 days, because the manufacturer will tell you when the month ends. Sure. So sometimes the month ends on, you know, February 2nd. Sometimes it ends on, you know, whenever. And and it's uh, it's it's just sort of an unnatural thing. It's hard to really predict. So here, here's my question. I mean, I get that. And often, you know, promotions that the OEM puts out are, you know, for a 30 day time span or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but I don't, you know, I would be shocked and maybe I'm about to get shocked, but I, I would be shocked if the OEM as a corporation tracked month to month versus quarter to quarter. I mean, when they, I, I can't see them sitting down with their CFO and all of the financial team and all that and all the investors and be like, all right, here's our monthly financial plan. They're probably reviewing quarters just like every yeah. other business on planet earth is looking at quarter to quarter. Um, right. 
Do you think it's just a disconnect between like the message that gets passed down to the dealer? Like, hey, and so they take it as you need to be tracking it month to month mm-hmm. or it versus, hey, yeah, here's the promotions. They happen month to month, but you really need to be paying attention to your quarter and you have you have the ability to do that. I mean, is that do you know where I'm going with that? I mean, is it I mean, is I, there just a disconnect in the way that message is being conveyed to the dealer or I mean, I I've been to the Renaissance Center. I've never been to the point where they're doing the the planning of financing there, but sure. I think it's a matter of not understanding what that looks like. When you as a as a marketing agency do a campaign, like you you have a start date and a stop date. Yeah. And you measure the entire time and that might be 90 days, it might be 60 days, it might be 15 days. But you sort of know what's going to happen after the fact, and you know how that campaign is going to interact with other campaigns. Um, dealers don't know that; they don't know what's going to happen. I mean, they could they could do a you know crazy you know sixty month zero percent you know we pay you eight thousand dollar rebate tomorrow. They may not know that; they don't know until it happens. Um, and so, oftentimes, it doesn't allow them to create a time horizon mm. that they can make those types of plans. And I think if you trickle that down to the individual on the showroom floor. Like they have no choice but to just, you know, trip all over themselves to try to make transactions as fast as possible. Right. Because they can't plan their life. You know what I mean? You don't know what's going to happen until those commercials hit or the radios hit. Um, you know, some people are really good at, you know, marketing their database and, and, and doing those uh, data mining things. Like as a whole, uh, even if these dealerships are using that technology, it's not used to its its fullest potential. You can't really plan for what's going to happen tomorrow. And so your only choice is to just absolutely go bananas um, for that month and then coast for a couple of days, maybe, you know, let yeah. the dust and, and get your <laughs> paperwork organized. Then you're back at it again. It is a, you know, I feel like I need to go take a Pepto-Bismol. <laughs> <laughs> just you know to you, you know in some like I, I don't know antacids to like help alleviate this the anxiety that I'm starting to feel in my stomach you, you know you, you really do get a sense wow I mean it's not that dealers want to be running around like chickens with their heads cut off but they have been forced into the, the chicken coop by yeah. the OEM so let me ask you this um because that's a big problem what are some simple things you think uh, or or that you've seen dealers can do in their own store and start, you know, not worrying about the region, the 20 group, the whatever, because I know that they, they will focus on those things anyways. But as the dealer principal, general manager, whatever, of ABC Motors, who's currently in the chicken coop, what are some small things I can be doing to affect change in in the atmosphere of my dealership today metrics like i said before i i it's a matter of even if they're i don't know if they're bad metrics but if, even if you feel like they're not accurate metrics as long as they're consistent metrics that gives you something to track and understand how you're performing um most crms have decent reporting i mean i think we're we've used like 24 25 different crms over the years now I'm not thrilled with the reporting from any of that I that I get. The only one I really like is the one that I built, you know, many moons ago. But, sure. um, but at any rate, it's a matter of like keeping track of those numbers month in month out, understanding how you're performing. Because again, you're you. That's the thing. As a dealership, you're your dealership. You're, you you have your own DNA. Um, what's successful for you or not successful for you uh, may not be the case for other stores. If that's one thing that you know, my career has taught me is that every dealership is totally different. So shiny object syndrome, be damned, 20 groups be damned. You know what I mean? Every dealership is a unique situation. But if you're tracking yourself against yourself, then you know how you're performing. Love it. And I, I feel like that, uh, and I, I know you're an attitude guy, but it'll, it maintains you to, or it helps you maintain a positive attitude when you know you're doing well. If all you ever see in your, in your, system or you know the your OEM updates or in the market or in your 20 group or whatever like if you feel like you're doing a poor job well if you're measuring yourself against yourself and you're on a positive trajectory you know you're doing something right sure so that's something that we can all do is just make that commitment i mean we we actually built our own tool uh to actually track performance of BD agents because we just couldn't find a good uh tool to assess that for us we had to make our own you know, mm-hmm. little, little us, 
You know what I mean? So, but but it's that important to us because we want to be able to let people know how they're performing month in and month out, yeah. you know, on a granular per lead level, but just show them, like go back and show them a positive trajectory and then benchmark them against people who are like them. Like, Hey, if you're using a similar process, this is what four other dealerships are, are doing that are similar to you. This is how you're performing. You're doing a damn good job. Pat yourself on the back. Don't feel bad. Yeah. You know, do we all want more? I hope so. You know, we're in a commission based business for the most part. You know, I hope we want more, but the fact of the matter is is that if we keep that positive attitude and we feel good about what we're doing, it's gonna affect how we we work. When people get down and they get upset because the information they're getting just doesn't feel right. Uh, if they feel like they're getting browbeat, they got something yell you know, somebody yelling at them in their ear that they're not doing a good job, like it sort of poisons things. A if Somebody is yelling at them, telling them they're they're not a good job. That person needs to be fired. Uh, you, you know <laughs> what? I, world, my friend. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. I mean, what I love about what you're saying here is it it really kind of it, uh, not kind of it really embraces the uh, individual aspect. Hey, your dealership mm-hmm. is unique. Um, there is no other Michael Cirillo out there. There's going to be people that are similar to him going to have similar challenges, all those sorts of things, but you are unique and therefore all 80 of your staff are unique. That makes your store truly unique. So mm-hmm. let, let's let talk about, you know, let's sit down and really discover what your definition of success is so that we can, mm-hmm. we can come up with, I mean, you're saying, Hey, the, the, the key performance indicators are really based on what your definitions of success are, what goals you want right. to achieve. And on the flip side of that, once we set those things up or once you've identified those as the dealer, mm-hmm. don't, who cares about what other people are doing? Because yeah. they're, they're not following the same course as you. Right. We, we give the numbers meeting. That's one of the things I say. I'm a, you know, I've kind of been known as a data guy, but it's up to us to give those numbers context. You sure. know, I mean, we, we get to decide what those numbers mean. Right. And if, if they're showing success, they're showing a positive trajectory, we're making more money, we're selling more units, whatever that goal is. Let's track it. Let's measure it. And let's understand how that, you know, how one metric affects other metrics. It allows us to really, you know, create a bigger picture and understand how different things influence our business. Yeah. And, it's, uh, and uh, I love this. You're right. We could talk about this for a few days. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I it, it, because you know why? Because it's the truth and it's what matters. I think, you, you know, the, the shiny object syndrome forces us into this cage of, Oh, that's what, you know, if Ford thinks this matters, then it must matter. Like this must be, you know, like I just, I don't know. You, you know what it leads to as, as you were talking about that, what it, what it made me think of is then you're happier. Like you said, wow, good job, guy. Like you guys are doing an incredible job as you're happier. You know, I'm reading a book right now and it talks about how the emotion, the the happiness emotion actually it has three degrees of separation from you because it, it spills mm-hmm. out to, you know, your coworker and your coworker's happy and it spreads off to maybe their spouse or significant mm-hmm. other. And then, the, you know, and, and all of a sudden you build this culture of like productivity and happiness, like true productivity, mm-hmm. because you're doing things that you enjoy because you're happy. Right. Exactly. I mean, was it dopamine? Is that the the you know what we get you right. know, from being happy and 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 feeling successful and all those things? Like it's, it's kind of a contagious thing. So I mean, it's that's a great point. Let me know what that book is, by the way. I'd love to read that. I'm a. It's called it, the Happiness Track. I'll link to it in the I show kinda, notes I for the like listeners. Books, if it's clear. Yeah. Although I'm like an I'm an Audible junkie though, so I've uh, I, I do more Audible these days. So. And, and I will confirm. I saw him pre-show. <laughs> <laughs> he actually pulled a book off of the shelf. It's not one of those like pull down, like flip up, you know, uh, uh, things. Yeah. I mean, it, it's called the happiness track. I can't, I can't think of the author's name right off. The, I, I just picked it up two days ago over the weekend and uh, started reading it. And I identified myself in the first three or four paragraphs of the introduction. I was like, this is going to be good. Um, but it really is this. It's, it's, you know, if you are tracking improperly, then you're always going to be down on yourself. If you're always down on yourself, you're going to be a boss, not a leader or a mm-hmm. boss of yourself, not a leader of yourself. That's going to negatively impact your coworkers. Everybody in the dealership's going to be down. Uh, and then 
you know, in and then what you're going to do is you're going to buy into some review platform that promises that it has a way, a secret sauce of mm-hmm. you getting positive reviews for your store, even though everyone can't stand the, the vibe of your store because everyone's down versus flip mm-hmm. that on its head. What do you want to achieve? Let's come up with some performance indicators for that. Holy crap, mm-hmm. you're doing really well. Yay, I'm happy. Culture's happy. Things start to, to shift and there you go. It's disruptive, <laughs> but it's disruptive. You know, let's give you a good example though. Kind of like a real, real, real world example. You sure. can edit that if you need to. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's staying in. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm human. Yeah. So, um, but uh, you know, uh, the OEMs will mystery shop dealers. I mean, pretty much every OEM does it now. Yeah. 90% don't do it internally. They send it out to somebody else. And, um, we had one instance uh, a few months ago where the particular manufacturer did a mystery shop. Uh, the person who did the mystery shop didn't put a phone number in there. And then they got a bad grade because they didn't call the mystery shopper. Mm. And we went in, looked at the serum, looked at the notes. You could see where the agent, you know, attempted to find a phone number or she, you know, had sent emails. You could see all this different stuff that the agent did. But the OEM messed it up. So instead of taking the bad grade and going, hey, why do we completely bomb this? They were able to go back in their system, you know, do a, you know, kind of a postmortem on what happened and mm-hmm. understand, hey, we did a great job. We did everything we were supposed to do. You know, this probably should have been an A grade. And, you know, then when it came next time to uh, discuss that with the OEM, they had some good ammunition to talk about that. And that's why, you know, measuring is so important and, and doing things the right way and being methodical on how you, you do things in the dealership because that way if something goes wrong, you can always see what happened, how you can change it, how, you know, other things affect um, the business. You know, I, I look at every dealership as like a microcosm and, sure. you know, we're all stuck with two DMSs, but we got some choices in terms of websites, unless you're in Canada, that's changing, but, yeah. you know, we, <laughs> but I mean, we... Um, you know, we have all these different variables involved, but allows us to isolate those things yeah. and understand how we can change those. But if we make that commitment, and even if that's using a spreadsheet, that's how I started measuring myself is just good old Excel comes yep. on you know, almost every PC. It's cheap to buy and and just start to keep track of the stuff on my own. And I, a manager didn't do that for me and the owner didn't do it for me. Um, but I can tell you when it came time to talk to ownership or talk to management, I was in the management team. Or, sure. But, I mean, like, but it's yeah. easier just to, you know, show the spreadsheet or show the print offs and go, this is what happened. Yeah. You know, cause we, we measured that. We made a commitment to that. That's a, you know, that's a great, that's a great nugget right there. I mean, because I know, I know so many people and I've been there myself, uh, focus on, but how, how can I, you know, well, here's one of those little hows. Uh, mm. get Google drive, you know, sheets yeah. or Excel spreadsheets and just start, you know, it, it, think about, you, you know, brief yourself. Hey, what do I want to, I just thought about how brief yourself could sound like, like put on some underwear, but uh, you, can, you can edit that out too. <laughs> I'm told, I'm just going to keep it in. I don't even care. <laughs> um, you, you know, it's, it's like, sit down, take the time necessary. I feel like people just don't take the time. We're so impatient. Well, they're um, busy hustling, Michael. They're busy hustling on Instagram and Facebook. Okay? <laughs> They don't have time for spreadsheets. Yeah. You know, it's, it's crazy, but, but, you know, com, to, total value in what you're saying. I mean, when you look at, and I'm going to use the the term successful, when you look at successful mm-hmm. people and, and I'll preface this by saying my definition of success in what I'm looking for in successful people are people that are truly happy, people who are truly grateful, who have abundance, but it's not the center of their universe. Right. You know, they, they want to help others. They realize that by helping others, it, it contributes, you know, and being contributors to society. So when I look at truly successful people, I cannot think of one of them who does not measure. Yeah. They're constantly measuring. It, they're, they're setting goals. They're, they're briefing themselves. They're debriefing themselves at the end mm-hmm. of every day and they're going into each day what am I what do I want to set out to do tomorrow that's going to help mm-hmm. me that's going to contribute to my definition of success you know so so for those of you listening or watching if you're not taking the time to do that what makes you think that you're going to get any different results it reminds me of what my dad used to say he's like it's like it's like uh, doing it that way is like sitting in a rocking chair there's lots of motion but no movement yeah 
That's a great analogy. I love that. And and a lot of people a lot of people are just sitting in that rocking chair. And so, you know, what, what you're talking about here, Bill, is something so simple. Like it's so easy for somebody to just log into their computer and, and, and consider what do they want to track themselves? How did I do yesterday? You know, I'm comparing myself to who I was yesterday. Am I moving forward? And, Mm -hmm. and it's almost this philosophy of, um, what does it be the change that you want to see in the world or something like that? Like it starts with you. You're the epicenter of, of disrupting the industry, so to speak. Mm-hmm. Love it, man. Listen, I appreciate you being on the dealer playbook. Like I said, thanks for having me. dude, th- I mean, I, this is just stuff I'm super passionate about and I can tell you are too, which, which makes for some really great conversation. Uh, I look forward to connecting with you in person when uh, we're at a, at, at one of these conferences together yeah. so we can talk <laughs> more about this. How can those listening uh, get in touch with you? Uh, you can reach me on Twitter at W Playford. Uh, LinkedIn is W Playford. Facebook's W Playford. Uh, email address is bill at dealernose.com. Um, if you want my phone number, it's 517-518-1456. I have this thing s- surgically connected to my body. So uh, I take text messages more than I take phone calls. But I'd love to help you out. Let me keep this discussion going because I like yourself. I'm very passionate about this. And I feel like if we just make some really simple commitments, we use the tools that are available to us as opposed to trying to get that shiny object to do it for us. We just make that commitment. Um, we're going to make a change. And a lot of the things that we've talked about doing 15 years ago, 20 years ago, can start to get that momentum that never had before. I could never get off the ground, never get started um, because we can't get out of our own box. Yeah. We can't get out of, uh, like I said, these rules of thumb or heuristics, you know, that, that, that keep us sort of bound to what we do. Uh, if we just sort of make a step to change that or to measure the possibilities or potential outcomes for ourselves, we can make those changes. All right. So some of the things I really enjoyed that Bill talked about, you know, a philosophy that I really buy into is the concept of, you know, you changing yourself first and kind of being in that perpetual cycle of improving yourself, knowing that it is going to have a positive change on those around you. Uh, Like I said in this episode of the show, I'm reading a book right now called The Happiness Track, which I highly recommend you check out. I'm going to link to in the show notes, which talks about this concept of improving or increasing our happiness and what effect that has. And you kind of heard that laced throughout this episode and some of the things that Bill was saying. I mean, you know, if you are constantly down on yourself because you feel like you are not achieving the objectives, you know, many of which have been imposed upon you, then you're going to be in this this cycle of just, you know, feeling down, feeling like you're not accomplishing anything. We need to shift that. You need to take some time and identify the things that you want to achieve in your life, in your career, uh, and determine what the key performance indicators will be to hold you accountable. You're going to measure all along and and something I'm, I'm pretty positive will happen. You'll recognize how much more you are uh, feeling uh, uh, feelings of fulfillment, how much more positive you feel. You're going to notice the impact that has on your productivity. I mean, that really, in my opinion, is how you, you disrupt what is currently happening in this somewhat stagnant, stale, mindset of an industry um, is by affecting yourself, having positive change happen within yourself. That's going to spill out. It's going to affect others. They're going to want to be able to do the same thing. And it just grows and grows and grows from there. If you are getting value out of the Dealer Playbook podcast, I would love a review on iTunes. Make sure it's an honest review. I don't want any puffed up this and that. It's got to be an honest review on iTunes. I would love and appreciate. Uh, Also, you know, if you feel free to share out the show and spread this message, I am on a mission to enrich and empower automotive professionals all over the world. I am so glad you are here and a part of this. Let's take on this mission together and just spread the good word. That's all I got for you this week. Keep the playbook open and dominate.